I'm Nancy Holt. Um, I lead an effort called Science for New York. Um, so Science for New York, who are we? We are an effort to bring local scientists and policymakers together through project-based interaction. And you know, we strive to support local communities. Our goal is really to improve the overall well-being of New York City, however we can. We are nonpartisan, we are non-advocates, so we want to help lend our skills as scientists to provide insight and analysis, um, but we don't really have desired outcomes. So we're not a group that advocates for any specific policy. We basically just want to look at the data as it exists and help policymakers and communities hopefully make better decisions that are informed by information. And your guides today will be me, Kristen, who is helping me with the slides, and Joe, who did much of the data analysis that you see. And I will just give them a second to briefly introduce themselves as well. So Kristen, did you wanna? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Kristen, and I am a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University Medical Center. Um, so as a neuroscientist, I study stress, and I have worked with Science for New York for uh, several years now, I'm really passionate about taking the data that we find and how to make it equitable to society. And Joe, did you have a... Hi, uh, I'm Joe. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Mount Sinai in New York, uh, and I study emotional memory um, and how it relates to trauma. Uh, and I'm really interested in the structure of data and how we can put data in formats that the general public um, can digest and use, um, make conclusions from that we can use to make decisions um, that affect people. Sure, and then I'll just, so a little bit about me is that I was born and raised in the Bronx. I actually went to Bronx Science, got a PhD in physical chemistry, and then wound up having the wonderful opportunity to do a fellowship that brought me into the State Department at federal government level. But I've always wanted to kind of come back to New York and contribute whatever skills I could to that process, which is kind of what led to Science for New York in the first place. So just some quick background. So why science, right? Um, we want to find ways that scientific information and or the analysis process that goes along with research can lend input to key challenges New York City faces. And this can include for us at least, and you know, other people may define it differently, but issues that directly relate to fields of science. So, you know, some examples are climate change, composting, STEM education, but also general research and analysis skills on topics of general importance. And for example, one of the projects we did was looking at affordable housing and the benefits um, and also as well the dis disadvantages of looking at housing first as a policy. So for us, it's more, um, let's focus on key challenges that people are interested on instead of saying, you know, we only work on COVID or we only work on climate change. That's not really our goal. Our goal is to lend support as much as possible to anything that can benefit from our skills. And then for the next slide, it's why scientists, right? So scientists in a way, um, I wouldn't say they're special, but in the academic setup, they kind of sit a little bit more outside of the world than other programs. So, you know, for example, there are many programs in New York City that have something called a capstone class where scientists can come and engage as a formal class and work on projects of relevance to New York City. Academic programs in the sciences tend to want to create professors and don't offer such similar opportunities. And as a result, scientists have sat a little bit on the outside of the policy conversation and that's something we're trying to change and we're trying to give them the skills and the tools to interact with policy while at the same point they can lend their research and analysis schools, analysis skills to the process. So New York City actually has a lot of scientists. Um, there's nine major academic medical centers. There's also a number of PhD programs across the scientific disciplines, engineering, technology, and mathematics. Um, because there's so much medical related research. There's $2 billion in NIH funding. There's over 7,000 graduate students and postdocs at universities. And most don't really have a pathway to contribute their skills easily unless they're sort of doing it on their spare time. I'm trying to help them as much as possible. Um, if you're interested in this idea and how it might work, um, along with someone from the city who works for the Department of Design and Construction and runs a program called Town and Gown, 
we talk about the idea of giving students more real world policy training. And this is something that Terry has done really, really well by coordinating capstone classes across the city. And very luckily we were a recipient of one of them, which allowed us to do this kind of work. So in the next slide, you know, I don't quite know the audience. I have the attendee list. Um, and I know many of you are technical experts in various ways, but I think science policy is a term that gets kind of thrown around a lot with not necessarily a lot of meaning all the time attached to it. So just to kind of get everyone involved, maybe the first thing you hear when someone says science policy, like what kind of topics come to your mind, especially with respect to New York City, that they can be more general. Just sort of curious what everyone's thinking and where they're starting from. All right, so we have climate change. That's the one I think of. Investment in education and our research, funding, budgeting, climate change. Yeah, <laughs> I think climate change is one of the big ones. Just wait another sec to see if anyone else has um, funding allocation. Yeah, so I think the main things that are coming up are funding and climate change, along with the same idea, investment in education. Yeah, transportation. So when we originally started doing this, I kind of just tried to put down everything I could in my mind that in some way I thought related to science policy, and that's on the next slide. Um, and that's kind of a big bunch of issues for New York City. There's some distinctions here, right? Because in the formal definition of STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, Health actually doesn't fall as a STEM field, but I think because there's many aspects of health and medicine, I think often of public health. And at the time when we started really working on science for New York more actively, obviously, and still, unfortunately, COVID was a big issue. Um, on the climate change side, the resiliency, vulnerability, transportation is definitely something we would put under this category. And um, STEM itself as a topic of, you know, giving more access to students. Um, along with that and issues that Beta NYC, I'm sure, is pretty passionate about, or I believe, um, you know, Wi-Fi access, broadband technology in New York City and beyond. So, like, just to kind of set the stage, because to some degree, the work we've been doing is trying to look at science issues in New York City. And one of the key pieces of that is actually establishing what those issues are and how we bin them and talk about them. So, next slide. So Kristen, oh, okay, great. So, um, so what we did, so when this work really picked up for us, it was summer 2020, you might remember the summer of COVID and then the sequel, 2021 summer of COVID. Um, we had the lab shut down in New York City and a lot of students came to us wanting to get more involved and to use their time to contribute their skills. And in the summer of 2020, we took on this idea of trying to frame out, and we were just trying to figure it out at the time, like what does science policy look like in New York City? What does it look like in a neighborhood? Everyone else has these cool maps. Part of it was kind of like, we want our own map. <laughs> so we basically made a big spreadsheet of all the data sources we could find and tried to figure out how to create this kind of map. Um, and it went through a number of Back and forth, we wound up having a single student, one student per borough, look at issues and come back to us and kind of come up with a plan on how we were going to use this data and how we were going to integrate these topics. It largely relied on analysis and expert judgment. And we kind of came down mostly on two key data sets. One is the community district health profiles from the Department of Health and Mental Health and then the community district profiles from New York City planning. And within the community district profiles, we looked at community boards and what they were listing under their statement of needs as relevant. So there's a number of ways to do this. This was like step one that, that we approached it from. It does not ever directly survey communities. That's something we would love to do. How you accurately do that, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but we could, you know, in theory, ask council members, we can ask other people because community board districts don't always really represent their entire community all that well. But this was kind of where we got started. So on the next slide. Um, so we came up with these categories that kind of take the, the survey slide and all of its topics and tried to bin them into manageable, discrete categories that we could define issues that people were talking about. And you can see them here, things that came up frequently, access to healthy foods, aging population, air quality, clean water, 
health outcomes, medical access, parks access, climate change and flooding, sanitation related issues, STEM and broadband access. And how we wound up getting down to this list was we sort of prioritized in three directions. So the stuff we were really looking for directly related to a STEM topic. Um, the second tier or the yellow was aspects that relate to STEM but were not overall connected to STEM. So like parks access, things that relate to health but then the actual ability to access them sort of one step removed from a STEM topic. And then we sort of bend everything else. So many things, like I said, like affordable housing, I think can benefit from additional data and analysis, but at the core, they don't relate to a STEM topic. So next slide, please. And this is what we came up with. We came up with this sort of science in your neighborhood map. And I don't know if Karen Ingram is on the call, but she was wonderful in helping to create and then visualize this map. What's interesting, you'll see obviously, on the coast, a lot of cases, climate change is the issue that we were able to figure out was really the priority. And like I said, some of that was our own expert judgment, but in some areas, it was also quite obvious that this is what people were really concerned with. Um, you know, there's some reductionism here, right? So under parks access, it doesn't always mean the same thing for every place in the map. And that's really hard to capture in this kind of visualization, but it may mean you have a park, but it's not repaired or it's not in a usable state. You may not have a park at all. You may have a big park, like up in um, the northern parts of the Bronx, like down Cortland, but the transportation or the ability to access that park isn't really equitable for everyone who lives within a certain distance of the park. Um, but like I said, this was sort of our first go at it, and um, we've been working to build on it ever since. So next slide, please. So there's an alternate version of this map. And in the version that I just showed you, basically because of the space and the ability to illustrate it, it's hard to fit a lot of icons in any single community board district. So we went with the idea of really saying, look, we have two that are close, maybe three that are close. We have to pick one and put it on the map. But in reality, for any given community board district, there's always a few issues that have popped up. And so this is an attempt to show that same map, but highlight additional issues for any given district. What we found in doing this was that in many cases, not all, the lower income districts, we had more issues that were science related that we couldn't quite distinguish which were highest priority or a number were elevating toward a high priority. And well, that's sort of, you know, generally in line what you can find across other issues in the city as well. We thought it was an interesting opportunity as scientists to maybe hopefully lend more expertise to these communities and, you know, maybe address, you know, challenges in a way that scientists can be an opportunity toward conversations and, and helping these communities. So definitely like to hear your feedback on that eventually, but that's sort of one of our takeaways from this work. So what did we do with this? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to scroll through. So we had two kind of main outcomes from this, one of which is we put an op-ed in the Gotham Gazette talking about this. So this was sort of the build back better, better time of the city. And we wanted to talk about the opportunity to bring in more scientists. And one of our conclusions was that there has never been more need or for effective partnerships between communities, government, and experts. Um, and we got a lot of positive feedback, actually. This was probably the, our first op-ed and the op-ed that generated the largest response, especially from some policymakers that reached out to us. And then we also had another wonderful opportunity to reproduce the map in a report called the State of Climate Knowledge, which involved the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. We had one of our volunteers um, there at the time and the map appears in this report and also, again, highlights the ability to, to hopefully bring in more scientists to the conversation. So from there, we kind of went to phase two, which was, like I said, we kind of hand sifted the topics and the data in order to get to our first map. But we got more and more interested in data analytics and had um, through Town and & Gown and through Columbia Lehman, the public interest, sorry, after public interest in data science corp took all of these long pages of PDF data from the community health profiles and help us and helped us convert those to CSV files. So I'm not a data scientist by training, 
but I will say they spent an entire summer and handed us back 60 unique sets of data files, which was wonderful because otherwise it was making the task very difficult in order to plot data. And the idea would be now that we can just automate this process, add in some expert judgment, and then be able to create new maps and new tools for conversation. So that's where Joe came to us, which was like kind of wonderful timing because we needed someone to take the data from the summer and start to help us visualize it. And that's in the next slide. So we continued this work. We took the data sets. We've added some new data sets. Our goals now are to start to look across different variables so we can overlay things now, right? People talk about health as related to housing, health is related to food, but it's not one single topic, right? There's a number of topics that contribute to the health of a neighborhood. There's a number of food related issues that contribute as well. We wanted to overlay these and we also wanted to look at other science issues like climate and how they interplayed with health and housing and health and food. And we also wanted in some way to be able to better describe and talk about more complicated issues like climate and housing policy. And for example, that got attention with the Green New Deal for public housing. And I think people recognize that in areas that are prone to flooding, there are also housing conditions, but I think the ability to visualize them can help add to the conversation. So these are just some examples. We're still kind of developing this work, but for example, Joe was able to overlay a certain number of food-related variables. So the ones that we used from the community health profiles were the number of farmer markets, the supermarket to bodega ratios, the fruits and vegetable servings, and the sugary drinks. And these are stats for any given neighborhood. And um, create this map, which is really an overlay of all of these things, which technically anyone could do because the data is public, but it's pretty labor and time intensive to do. And the color coding from severe to mild kind of tells you one standard, how many standard deviations out any community is when all of these variables are overlaid together. So next slide. We did the same thing for housing related variables. So we looked at things like air conditioner access, overlaid with air pollution, overlaid with homes reporting cockroaches, overlaid with homes with maintenance defects. And again, wound up with a map of the city that could help us look specifically at which communities are being hardest hit. But I think one of the nicest features of this map and one that was hard for us to make originally um, was in the next slide. So Joe has created it so that you can hover over any given neighborhood. And just like the example of parks access, right? Housing might be an issue in a given neighborhood, but it may be one of those specific variables is leading a lot more to the problem than others. And so this kind of interactive map allows you to hover over a given neighborhood and try to figure out what is actually the source of the housing problems out of the set of variables. One of the things we wanted to do, and you can kind of see it here, is really there's always data out there, right? We can cut the data however we want, but ultimately we want this to have a value in fixing the problem. So we were hoping to kind of highlight different policies, either legislation that exists that maybe people don't know about or isn't being enforced, or legislative proposals that are out there that could help address some of these challenges and kind of take all of this data and bring it to an end point where people and neighborhoods can discuss what might be solutions to it. So, you know, that's kind of one use we foresee for this kind of data. Uh, the next slide. So here's where it kind of like, we're just adding layer on layer on layer. And this is sort of the culmination of where we're at at the moment. Um, but we wanted to look at Examples, like I said, of housing and climate policy. So we overlaid housing and flooding data where we took the community health profile data and then laid over it um, the community district health, the community district profiles from the Department of City Planning. And we looked at the number of residential units in the 1% floodplain. So that's now the background color, which you can see on the right goes from kind of light green to dark blue is severe. And then we overlaid those same dots the dots that you see are the colors from the previous slide overlaid as just dots. And again, you can hover over them and see kind of what's contributing to the housing issue in that area. 
and you can get a better picture, hopefully, or a better point of conversation about what housing and flooding policy or changes might be and how they might benefit any given neighborhood. And so I realized, like, I've been looking at this graph a lot, so I might take a sec where you guys might actually be way better at looking at this stuff than I am. But that's kind of like our goal. And obviously, from here, we can tweak and continue to improve the data. So the last things really are one of the things, you know, we talk about flooding, but obviously for climate change, heat is also an issue. We've been working, and if any of you know how to lend us some support here, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, there's a heat map on the city council website, and it um, we've been trying to reproduce it. We haven't been able to download its data directly, and Joe has been working with new satellite data from NASA. Funnily enough, someone who graduated from my research group at Berkeley now leads this effort, so I was able to contact her and get us to help um, find the data and figure out how to use it. But there's some subtleties to this. If you have questions, you can ask Joe. There's clouds in the data. There's averaging over years and picking the right months to average, which make it a little tricky. But we would, again, like to go back and look at how housing and heat are having impacts. For example, air conditioning access is a challenge, and those will be you know, policy-related, of course. So we would like to be able to display them and talk about them with people. So just very quickly, we're sort of coming to the end here. Um, one of the other things, and we don't have much time to talk about it, is we've tried to make climate snapshots by council district um, in order to help some council members because much of the data is by community board district and there are definitely resources out there to do this. But again, it's an issue of many things are in many places. And even as data scientists, I think we struggle to put this all together into one picture and one story that communities can talk about and can engage on a little bit more easily and not just sort of cherry pick different parts of the issue. I don't actually know anyone from Beta NYC, but if you're on this call, like the boundaries map has saved us <laughs> in doing this. It has been the most useful map that we spend a lot of time looking at to figure out where the community boards and where the council districts overlap. And for example, which wastewater treatment plant falls within that boundary. So here I can actually go in and look street by street and figure out where the lines are that cross. And if you're interested more in this work, of course, please reach out to me. But also um, we have an op-ed on this in the Gotham Gazette. Um, and by Shelley, who's also on this call, was tremendous help in all of this work and helped co-author this piece. I actually wrote it and I just sort of signed off on it. Um, so the very last things to talk about, sorry, just a quick summary, right? So I, you guys know this way better than I do, but you know, as scientists trying to engage with this, data and policy can sometimes be hard to connect. And hopefully as scientists, we can help. Right? There are many things that we don't know about policy and the more you can help train us, I think the better, but the more we can lend our skills in return. I think that's kind of a great relationship for, in my mind, for New York City, hopefully. Oftentimes, just like in science and experiments, when you go through the data, what you think is the main driver of a problem often isn't. And I think, you know, many people, of course, work around that issue and struggle to communicate that. But I think scientists can also lend um, insight into that to sort of getting to the core of what actually might be a problem as opposed to sometimes what gets wrapped up in the conversation. Um, understanding where to start is really a challenge. Like I said, we came to this just trying to like figure it out and trying to think about it in some way that relates to us. Um, and, and we found that to be a real challenge. So I think for the average user, that's also a challenge as well. Visualizations can help here. I think it's really hard to overlay data in your head. And a lot of these processes kind of require you to do that to get to something you know, meaningful. And hopefully those kinds of visualizations can catalyze new conversations in and across communities. The last one is I know this is a problem of data on many, many levels, you know, federal when I used to work on it, but incomplete data sets, hard to extract formats, different timeframes all really present barriers to making these kinds of maps. And, you know, if we can be part of conversations that might help show, you know, areas where we've struggled and how maybe the city can help us correct that, that would be fantastic for us. Questions? These are some ideas I had for questions, but. Hey, Nancy K here. 
Uh, yes, I can. Just, just want to say thank you. Um, Joe says the visualizations were made with custom written Python scripts using Plotly as the visualization package. Nice. Thanks, Joe. Um, Nancy, could you go back to some of those uh, finishing points? I had a question. You know, I, I'm working from uh, the government side with open data, and some of those points were pretty key. You mentioned like data and policy could be sometimes hard to connect. What, what are the ways you tried to connect so far with policymakers and, and you being on the data side of things? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's both. I think it's also what you're saying, right? It's data and policy and data and policymakers. And obviously in New York, there's um, a lot of policymakers that are interested in this. So from the perspective of data and policy, I think the cartoon kind of sums it up, right? There's a lot of information, but it's <laughs> the bridging piece of how to apply it, how to use it, how to look at, you know, all the different interests right. in New York City. That's always, you know, the challenge. And I think you know, even like an issue, like, for example, we just put a piece on composting in city limits um, today, but we literally tried to separate behind that piece and why we made it all the different science aspects of composting. And it becomes a lot. And if you're trying to have a conversation with someone who doesn't have that much time to hear all of it, it's hard to convey to the public, right? It's not just one piece of a solution or another piece of a solution. And I think that's where visualizations really step in and help. They take this sort of completely complicated thing that would take, you know, scientists would love to talk to you about for three hours and they can show it in a way that captures its complexity, but doesn't get you bogged down in its complexity to the point where we can't make a decision or we can't find a path forward. So I don't know if that's like a great answer to your question, but that's kind of where I get stuck all the time is, you know, sort of how do you start from this baseline, add the layers on it, then cut out the details so you can tell a policymaker just enough without making it so complicated that it's hard to make a decision. Um, and also, I think, you know, scientists are getting better at this, but they love to tell you all the details without telling you anything you can do about it. So you know, that's kind of a struggle. I think also, you know, New York City, there's, I mean, you know, there's 59 community boards, 51 right. council members, so many committees on the council, you know, it's just hard to, even as scientists, it's hard to kind of keep up with people and get their attention and be able to have time to discuss these kind of issues. So right, right. I'm open to suggestions, right? If you, if you have thoughts. Right. No, no, I've seen it. <laughs> and um, it, I've seen exactly what you're talking about. And um, I've seen also the the burden with trying to make those connections. And I've seen some success in it, right? Um, you mentioned a team that definitely helped set all of this up, uh, Beta NYC, pretty good team. And they actually, I think, were successful in the, making the kind of connections you're talking about. Uh, I know you want to give a big thanks to them when possible. So i um, happy to reach back to my team that put me on this call and uh, make a connection there because yeah, they've kind of have some experience in doing all of that. And thank you. Thank you for explaining like the challenges there. Yeah, no, that, I would definitely appreciate it. I, I watch Beta NYC. I've never, for some reason, I think when I got on the call initially about our proposal for this, they said, did you know Beta NYC? I said, I was supposed to go to a meeting like literally March, 2020 and didn't wind up going in person and then didn't uh, have an opportunity to meet them <laughs> since. So, so. so I want to give some people a chance as well. I'm seeing some questions pop in. We have Dan. Um, saying that he's came across uh, a lot of data comparing different policy strategies. Have you come across data comparing different policy strategies for the issues you've looked at? So come across data comparing different policy strategies for the issues that you're looking at. So, I mean, I would say some of this came about somewhat organically, not like a pun on composting. Um, people had reached out to us at some point about the Green New Deal for public housing and that got me thinking about these kinds of topics and how do we make them easier to engage with or easier to, to relay to people. Um, I'm sure there's like research on this and different kinds of ways to do this. I've done it much more like sort of in the experiential learning format of talking to people, getting feedback, um, seeing where they come to us. But yeah, I, I haven't compared it in a... As a scientist, I should have researched what is out there for research. I guess in the funny anecdote, when I used to work at the State Department, my boss, you know, negotiated a lot of international climate change 
work and recycles a big pile of papers on his desk. And he's like, I just have no time to research this because I do this every day. And so I've kind of taken the approach of trying to figure out as much as I can through talking to people. But it would be interesting to truly kind of look through and try to make some sense out of how one actually does this and you know where we've been successful and where we haven't. I do know Raleigh Williams, so I'm trying to read the comment, but I actually know him through other channels. Mm -hmm. um, trying to do similar things with his, yeah, he does wonderful stuff on Climate Town. He's not on the call, but he, he did a little um, event for us during the pandemic. And yes, watch Climate Town for sure. Yeah, sorry, just trying to read Frank and says, talk. Uh, Frank says your comment earlier on data and policy makes sense. And um, he sees that. He's also just confirming if that's why you use visualizations and op-eds um, as the output of your work, um, because they do a good job of summarizing. Would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, even beyond that, right? So it would be nice to then take these kinds of policy issues and I guess to the last point about how to, how to be effective in these things, I've seen more and more scientists try to make almost like little cartoons. I've talked to Karen about this, or, you know, when you take a big problem and you kind of draw in all the little pieces that contribute to the problem and you can kind of show them in scale and scope. And, and right. so I, I guess where we got caught, sorry, this gets me excited, but like Open data is um, a little bit further from my background, because even though I'm a chemist, I am not a data analytics person. And what I really strive to do is take all this information and get it out there in creative and useful ways. And so I look not as much at the data, but sort of all the tools that we could pick up to do this kind of work and cartoons, visualizations, um, Anything along those lines, I think, helps engage people. I think my analogy, right, is I often watch a ton of house shows. And for some reason, right, you stage a house because people can't see the vision unless the furniture right. is in it, even though right. they're looking at the room. <laughs> and it's hard to have conversations awesome. with people. It's hard without like a summary paragraph or a snapshot or something. So all of these are geared toward that end to make these conversations easier and more productive and anyone who has ideas on how we might do that better or more effectively, you know, please reach out. Well, um, Nancy, Kristen and team, um, I think you're in the right place. Thank you for Thank presenting you. this content um, this afternoon. Um, you know, I think this is a great first step in letting people know what you do and also in making the connections along with other civic technology groups that exist out here in you know, I think that they could definitely get things up to speed to where, of course, you're deep into your study, but also being able to get access to the tools and, and, and get the ball rolling on how to synthesize that data uh, a lot more for the general public. So this is great. Uh, just reach out to us, please, if you, you have thoughts and ideas. We're still trying to figure it out. And I know there's a lot of people who know a whole lot more about this than we do, but the more I can help scientists get out there and contribute, the better.